So over the last six, seven, eight years, we've uh, we designed and built and installed and now operate, I think, 22 telescopes um, at uh, seven or eight sites around the world. And the locations of our telescopes are shown on the map. We have uh, three sites in the south, one in Chile, one in South Africa, and one in Australia. And we have, I have to count them, one, two, three, we really have, at the moment, four working sites in the north. We have uh, telescopes on Maui, on Haleakala. We have, uh, we actually have a second of these telescopes that we've just installed at McDonald Observatory in Texas, Tenerife in the Canary Islands, and the Wise Observatory in Israel. And we're working on telescopes, which you'll, you can see in the back, that are going to go to, to Western Quebec um, next year or the year after. And so, we operate all of these 22 telescopes as a single observatory so that people who have time on our telescopes or allocated time can put in a request for an observation. And we have this uh, piece of software called the scheduler that figures out at any given time 15,000 requests for observations, how to send them out to all the sites so people get what they want when they want. And so this is unique in the world. No one else has done this. No one else is doing this. Uh, and it turns out to be a really uh, important capability for studying things that are constantly changing. And so that's what we do. We do um, what we call time domain astronomy. So things that change from, from one night to the next, or from one month to the next, or occasionally from one minute to the next, we can, we can follow those changes by using our entire network. Um, we have 40 employees. We're mostly based right here in, in Goleta. Uh, we're here because Wayne lives, lives nearby. Uh, we have another office in uh, Liverpool, which the, the, uh, the marker fell off, uh, uh, and we have a few people there, and then we have a couple of people in, um, in Hawaii and, and a couple of people in Australia. We have them there because they are actively maintaining the biggest of our telescopes. Those places, we have two-meter telescopes, so 80 inches in diameter, uh, medium-sized ones, uh, which you'll see the most of here, are one-meter telescopes. Uh, and then the little ones are, are 40 centimeter telescopes, about 16 inches. And so uh, the two big telescopes have low, our staff there, but all the other telescopes are at well-established astronomical observatories where we contract with the local staff to help us maintain them. But the telescopes are robotic, and so people don't, don't have to be there when they're operating. They just point where we tell them to point, and they take data by themselves and send the data back to us, and we process it and make it available for the scientists and educators who are using it. So that's a very quick overview of who we are and what we do. Um, and I guess I'm going to hand over to Joey, who's going to take you on from here. How's everybody doing? Great. Good. Good. Excellent. So we are going to talk about exoplanets. But before we can actually talk about exoplanets, we need to talk about, well, planets, right? So. Um, given this crowd, y'all probably know what a planet is, but generally speaking, um, the point that I want to make is that there's a lot of stuff in our solar system that's not planets. Specifically, I'm thinking of things like this big guy right here, um, which is a star, right? Not a planet, right? We have comets and asteroids and... Yeah. <laughs> Pluto. Yeah. We'll get to that. <laughs> what? <laughs> right. So, um, some of you may remember the uh, long ago days of 2006 when Pluto was officially <laughs> demoted uh, um, from planet to dwarf planet, right? Which is kind of a. It, it, it is an, a distinction, right? Um, but realistically, that was done because a lot of things were being discovered out by where Pluto was that looked a lot like Pluto. And this is really, in 2006, this is actually just a repeat of something that happened in the mid-1800s to a bunch of things that we now call asteroids. So there was about almost 50 years where Ceres was considered a planet. And we had almost 18 planets at one point. So uh, it's not the first time, but you know, it takes about 100 years to and then another hundred years to get over it, apparently. Um, so Pluto is not a planet, but it's not the only thing that's not a planet. We've got a lot of stuff out there that's not a planet. 
Uh, most of these are moons, including the moon. And we also have some asteroids down here, and then Pluto and Charon, which are uh, not. They're trans-Neptunian objects, or Plutinos, technically, <laughs> if you get even more specific. That's a whole other talk. Um, but the basic idea is that we actually now have a technical International Astronomy Union approved definition of planet, right? And the reason that we have that is because trying to categorize stuff in the solar system is a mess. And basically what we did when we made that distinct definition of planet is we took this box right here and pulled it out of this spaghetti nonsense, right? So do y'all actually know the definition of planet? Do you know the first, the first rule? All right, so to be a planet, you have to orbit the sun, right? The second rule is that you have to be in hydrostatic equilibrium, which is a fancy way of saying roundish. Basically, mm -hmm. you have to be big enough that you, your own gravity has pulled all the rough edges to make you roundish, right? And then the third one, right? Pluto orbits the sun. Pluto is in hydrostatic equilibrium. It's the third one where it fails, and that is clear its orbit, which is a hand-wavy description of a mathematical statement that was originally written in the definition. So the idea there is that you have to, the object has to dominate its orbit and be substantially larger than the rest of the mass that shares an orbit with it. Um, so for instance, Jupiter shares an orbit with thousands, maybe millions of asteroids called Trojans but they are negligible compared to Jupiter's orbit. In fact, their orbits are almost exclusively determined by the gravity of Jupiter and the sun, right? Jupiter is basically unaffected by them. Pluto fails this in two ways. The first being it uh, is almost the same size as its moon, right? Uh, Charon, so that's basically it, it, it fails in that sense, which really is probably a limitation of the definition more than it is of Pluto itself. But also Pluto crosses Neptune's orbit, and Pluto's orbit is actually dictated by the orbit of Neptune, not vice versa. So Neptune gets to be the planet, Pluto gets to be the trans-Neptunian object in a 3-2 resonance with Neptune. So um, the rest of this stuff we're not really going to worry about today. The point is more to just there's a lot of different naming conventions, and they're all overlapping, and it's a complicated mess. So that's kind of the point. So pulling planets out of this and giving them a st distinct definition that allowed them to be separate does have value, right? So we've now talked about what a planet is. But you might notice that there is a key proverso here that does not allow for something orbiting another planet, another star, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we'd call an exoplanet. So basically, in general, if you fit those other criteria, you're not a star, and you're orbiting a different star than the sun, we call you an exoplanet. Artist rendition, not real picture, right? Not real. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, have, I have several pretty pictures in here that are not real. <laughs> including this one. <laughs> All right, so... Um, Exoplanets are really interesting because until the last 50 years, we didn't have, or even more recently that, the only example of a solar system that we had was ours, right? So we had no idea what these other systems might look like. This is a real system that's been discovered. It's called TRAPPIST-1. Obviously, these are artist renditions of the planets, and they're not to scale, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, I believe they might be to scale with each other, but they're not spaced appropriately. Um, but this actually, like, if you squint and didn't know any better and I took away the labels and stuff, you might be like, oh, that's kind of, so what's going on with Jupiter over there? You know, like, it, it's, it's, there are a bunch of planets of varying sizes in, in this stellar system. And so these sorts of systems, systems that are like our solar system, definitely exist. But there are many, many more that are many, that are much weirder. This is a mess of a plot that I'm going to point out just a few key features of because a lot of you are very far away. So this, what this is, is these are all the stars discovered, um, I believe, before 2012 by Kepler. 
um, that have been that were confirmed, and all of them orbiting in their little orbits, placed on top of a schematic of the solar system. So this is not where they were in the sky. They're simply um, renditions of them that are placed on top of a depiction of the solar system. So this is the solar system, right? Right here. So this is the sun in the center, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. This is Jupiter's orbit. This is Saturn's orbit. This over here is Uranus, right? So our solar system doesn't look like these. And we're going to talk about why, at least why that's somewhat true uh, a little bit later on. But for now, just the general idea I want to get out is that there are a lot of different kinds of stellar systems. And we're no longer limited to this single idea of a kind of hierarchical terrestrial planets in the front, gas giants in the back, and then these other things later on. There are many, many different kinds of beasts out there, and we do not know that much about them. So, more philosophical. Why do we care? Why do we care about exoplanets? Well, there are several reasons, and I'll start with the probably the most scientific and abstract. Um, Fundamentally, one of the major questions that we want to know as scientists, as humans, is where did we come from? Why are we here? Right? So, um, to answer that question, as an astronomer, I look at that from a very literal standpoint of where did the solar system come from? Because if there was no solar system, there would be no Earth. If there was no Earth, none of us would be here. So, we want to understand how stellar systems form. And the only close-up example of that that we've had until recently is our stellar system, our solar system. And we have we made a bunch of theories, we made a bunch of models based on how our solar system looked today and what sort of mechanisms might have existed that allowed it to become, to, to enter into its current configuration, right? Well, now we're looking at other stellar systems, and this is, this is a kind of a general idea of that model, right? So you start off with a big gas cloud. The gas cloud begins to consolidate, continues consolidating until a star is formed. That's uh, the rest of the gas condenses into a disk around it. And then out of that disk, various inhomogeneities create planets that clear the rest of the disk and typically throw a lot of mess outside or inside to the star. Um, so that's kind of the general idea of stellar formation. But there are a lot of details in here and the details are vitally important for how you actually get planets that you know people might be able to walk on and breathe the air so um understanding that is important and when we first started finding exoplanets we found out that most systems that we were finding at least at first did not look like ours um a big key difference is that there are these things called hot jupiters out there so these are things the size of jupiter bigger close to the size of Jupiter, that are very, very close to their star. So they're orbiting every couple days. Jupiter, for instance, takes about 12 years to go around the sun, right? The Earth takes one year to go around the sun. These guys are going around in a couple days. So inside the orbit of Mercury, basically, if you stuck a Jupiter there, right? And we don't have any formation mechanisms that will allow something like this to form there. So that's very important, and that says a lot to um, how these solar systems must have formed. Also, there are another type of thing that we do not have any example of in our solar system. These are called super-Earths. So these are rocky, probably, rocky bodies that are a couple times the size of Earth, right? In our solar system, you have kind of the smaller planets, Mercury and Mars. You have the small terrestrial planets, Mercury, Mars, you have the, the large terrestrial planets, Venus and Earth, which are almost exactly the same size. And then you jump to many times the mass of Earth with the ice giants mm -hmm. out in the edge of the solar system. And then you jump many, many times more than that again to the gas giants of Saturn and Jupiter. There's nothing in between Earth and Neptune in our solar system. And so our, our formation mechanisms for how terrestrial planets form didn't really allow for these things, but we're finding them in real life out there, so you got to be able to make them somehow. And then finally, the other big question, the reason to look for exoplanets is 
the question of are we alone? Is it just us? Or are we the only life forms out there? And in our, albeit limited experience, life only exists on planets because we've only seen it one place. And so um, if you want to look for it elsewhere, you probably need to look for planets. So that is a big point. Um, a big reason why we want to look for exoplanets is, is to understand how frequent Earth-like conditions are. And in that vein, um, so there's a, this is something that will probably come up again, but uh, is the idea of the habitable zone. So that is the vaguely the rain, the distance from a star that a planet of Earth's size can exist and have, with an Earth-like atmosphere, have liquid water on its surface, right? So if you, it's, got, it's also called the Goldilocks zone, but habitable zone is less literary. If you, so basically, if you move it too close to the sun, all the water evaporates. If you move it too far away from the sun, all the water freezes, right? That's the general idea of the habitable zone. And this is important for us uh, as a mechanism of kind of a shorthand for could life potentially exist there? Because all life, there's really only one thing, well, two things that all life on Earth actually needs. It's water and energy, right? That's pretty much it, right? They're, they're microbes that eat rocks. So there's a lot of different variety out there, but everything needs water to at least some degree. And everything needs energy. So not saying that there isn't life that could exist in different conditions, but this is what we look for when we're talking about habitable planets. It's really from a very egotistical, self-centered point of view. Um, and we found a lot of planets that are in habitable zones of other planets. And just for reference, right, so here's the sun. So Earth is nicely in the habitable zone. Mars is actually in the habitable zone on the edge, but Mars is small. Right? If Mars were Earth's size, liquid water could more easily exist on its surface. Mm -hmm. And there is actually evidence for liquid water on the surface of Mars, but it's typically temporary. Um, and then Venus is way over here, inside, too hot, no water, basically. All right, and so have you all seen this before? This is called the Drake Equation. Um, another reason for studying exoplanets is that it helps us fill in the Drake Equation. Right, so uh, I'm going to run through it really quick. So n is the, as it says up there, the number of civilizations that we could potentially communicate with. Uh, and this isn't an equation in the traditional, like scientific, mathematical sense. This isn't used to solve any problem. This is a philosophical sort of idea, right? And in order to get a handle on how many civilizations might be out there, you basically need to know every one of these numbers, right? So R is the rate of star formation in the galaxy. So how many stars are made per year in the galaxy, um, which is on order like less than 10, basically. Um, next, we need to know the fraction with planets. And that's where a lot of our work with exoplanets, Kepler, space mission, things like that, have actually started to fill that in. And that's looking pretty close to one, actually. <laughs> um, now, how many of those systems have habitable planets? So planets within that habitable zone. If you use our solar system as an example, it's two-ish? <laughs> you know, uh, this is where things start getting a little bit more nebulous and where we need more, more research to actually nail these down. And then these, these are just, who knows? Um, so what fraction of those habitable planets develop life? What fraction of those habitable planets with life develop intelligence? And by intelligence, I just mean someone who can yell out into space, <laughs> right? Because what fraction of those intelligent civilizations will actually communicate? And then the last one, which is really the biggie, is what is the lifetime of that communicating civilization? And that doesn't necessarily mean how long is the civilization itself last. But that means how long will a civilization be broadcasting signals into space in a way that we would be able to interpret it, right? So even now, right, if you look at our civilization that has been broadcasting things into space, it's hundred-ish years old, right? But for the last 
30, a lot of effort has been going into increasing the efficiency of our own communication. A lot, a lot less of the energy of our broadcast is actually making it out into space. We're using more wired communication. Our wireless communication is more localized, like the Wi-Fi in this building. None of that information makes it to space, right? So how long will a civilization actually, like in our, we're using this exclusive, ex, yeah, exclusively with radio waves. Who knows what's next? So that is the big key there, and that's the real, real unknown that we, it's hard to even guess at, because we don't even have a sample size of one. So anyway, so those are some of the reasons um, that we are very interested in exoplanets. And then for the next part, we're going to talk about how we actually find them. Thank you, Joey. Um, so now that we know uh, what is an exoplanet and why to, are we interested to find them, uh, I'm going to discuss um, the techniques that scientists use to actually detect them. Um, but just before going to exoplanet, I will do like Joey. I will come back to our own solar system. and. Uh, uh, describe some properties which are very important because we use them all the time uh, to uh, discover exoplanets. So the first one was discovered actually in the 16th century uh, by Johann Kepler. And while he was studying data from his mentor Tycho Brahe, uh, he um, actually discovered that if you plot If you plot, so this is in logarithmic scale, if you plot the distance from each planet uh, versus the time of the orbit of uh, each planet, in logarithmic scale, it creates this perfect line. Mm. And of course, when Kepler found that, he said, OK, that's not random luck. That's mm -hmm. something behind the scene. And in fact, uh, in logarithmic, that means um, it's because the period square of the period uh, of the planet is proportional to the distance cubic um, to the to the sun, and this is very important property that we use all the time uh, when we do exoplanets. But also this one one of the fundamental relation that helped Newton to find uh, history of gravity, because you have to explain the apple fell on the tree, but you also have to explain where this property. And these two things actually uh, helped Newton to make his theory of gravity, but we're not going to speak about Newton today. So this is the first point which is really important, is period and distance are linked mathematically. And the second one is, uh, we often say that planets orbit stars, but it's only half true. So in this cartoon, which is not in scale, uh, I plot only Jupiter and the Sun because it's 99.9999% of the total mass of the solar system. So you can <laughs> consider the solar system is only Jupiter and the Sun, and, and you're pretty right. So when Jupiter is orbiting the Sun in this circular orbit, in fact, it's not orbiting the center of the Sun here. It's orbiting this point here that we call Barry Center. And basically, this is a point, an imaginary point, where the uh, gravity force, uh, the sum of gravity force of the solar system is uh, equal to zero. And, and actually, when Jupiter orbits this imaginary point, actually, the sun also orbits this point as a reactive movement. So that means when Jupiter does this, the sun in the same time does this. But because the sun is so much massive uh, than Jupiter, this point is very, very close to the sun. Actually, sometimes this point is inside the sun. So that means when the orbit of Jupiter is very big, the orbit of the sun is very tiny, right? And this fundamental concept uh, is of pretty important for exoplanet detection, and uh, I'm gonna uh, discuss it uh, later. Okay, so in this talk today, I'm going to speak about the detection of exoplanets in a chronological order, so uh, the history of detection. And so the first planets detected ever um, was around Pulsar. So that's a bit, um, it's a bit bizarre because Pulsar are actually not um, common stars, they are dead stars, they are neutron stars. 
So neutron stars are res a result of uh, the explosion of the supernova, which, it, which is the death of a giant star. And uh, pulsars are neutron stars with very high magnetic fields. This is represented by these lines here. And also pulsars, they rotate on themselves very quickly. The period of rotation of pulsar is order of milliseconds. And also pulsar, which has a remarkable, they have a beam of light along their uh, magnetic pole, like this. And because they rotate, as I said, uh, if you observe a pulsar, you will see this beam of light coming periodically to you, like a lighthouse, okay? So this is known in, uh, since the 60s, roughly. And here you have a true uh, image composite in UV mm. and uh, optical in red, UV in blue, of the Crab pulsar. And you can see the kind of jet here. And uh, this pulsar is famous because uh, it's a result of the explosion of the supernova that occurred 1,000 years ago. And it was observed by Chinese and Arab people. And they, are, they write it in some books. And it was so bright that you can see it during the day, actually. But, uh, but anyway, so in 1912, uh, Boltzmann and Fry, they were studying Pulsar. And uh, by studying, in particular, this one, 1267, they found that the, uh, the period of the beams that they were measuring was only quasi-periodic. Uh, there was some variation that they can't really explain and understand. And actually, they realized that uh, if you had in... Uh, in this system, planets are biting this pulsar. That explains very well the variation of the period of the beams they receive. And this is because those three planets that they found around this system, um, they also create a barycenter in the system. And so the pulsar also orbit this barycenter of the uh, periodic system. And so this extra orbit of the pulsar creates the time variation that they found. So the first planet found was actually very small mass planets some Earth mass like orbiting on Mars, but around a dead star. So that's mm -hmm. remarkable. So this method is very efficient because you can measure the mass, the period, the distance, a lot of properties. The only problem is pulsar intrinsically are very rare objects. Um, so it's not the best way to find a lot of planets. The second technique is uh, radial velocities. And we have a video which is going to help to explain that. Oh, yeah. I will check that. So in this cartoon, you have uh, an exoplanet orbiting a star. And again, the star is orbiting its barycenter. And what happened when uh, a star is orbiting its barycenter is when the star is coming towards you, the star looks bl more blue. And when you go uh, far away from you, it looks redder. And because this system is periodic, you will see the color of the star changing all the time. Blue, yellow, red. And uh, to study this effect, wha what we use is called uh, spectroscopy. So the idea uh, is to you use your telescope with a spectrograph. And the spectrograph is a tool that disperses the light coming from the star in various colors. So here, for example, you have a, an example of a spectrum of a star where the light in blue here and light in red. and you. And you have all the uh, visible band of the star in all colors. And when the star moves, you see that the color in the spectrograph shifts from left to right. And this uh, phenomenon is periodic because the orbit of the planet is periodic. So by following uh, the color of the star versus this time, you are able to map uh, this change in color. And from this change in color, you are actually able to measure the speed of the star. This is what we call uh, radial velocity. Okay. And from this technique, you are able to uh, extract the period, of course, and uh, what we call the semi amplitude k. And thanks to these two quantities, we can estimate the mass of the planet. Right? Has to be pretty big, doesn't it? Uh, to make right. the star move? Um, right now, we are able to detect uh, Earth's mass uh, planet thanks to radial velocity. Okay. But very unlimited. Oh. In general, it's working better for most planets. Yes. Um, did you just say that we're almost to detecting Earth 
size planets. Uh, yeah, we we, we we start to have spectrograms that should be able to do that in maybe five years. And what and what is the technology that has to happen to make that? You have to. Uh, the problem is spectrography in general. You do that from Earth because it's very expensive to put a spectrograph in space. Mm -hmm. So you need to reduce a lot of the contamination from the sky, etc. And you need very um, pressure and temperature control instruments. And all of this is very expensive and very hard to do. And so this is a hardware part. And in terms of software, there is a lot of to, to be done to, to uh, improve your expression of the right. signal. And there's also the fundamental problem that stars are not necessarily still, right? Like yeah. the surface of the star okay. itself is moving at rates that are comparable to the movement that's caused by some of these small planets. Yeah, yeah there is tons of problems. There is also spots on stars that can limit radial velocity. Mm -hmm. You need the mass of the star, right? Yeah, I, I will say that. Formulate that according to. The I will color? say mass of the star is not the hardest part to get. Uh, we have other technique as an astronomer um, to measure the mass of star in general. Well, this mentioning the problem of the atmosphere of the star is shifting, that might be more of a problem, I would think. Getting a yeah, but mass. It, it's hard. It's not very linked to the mass itself of the star. Oh, okay. It just changes the signal to other areas. Yeah. But the mass of the star, for example, the Gaia mission is very good for that. The European Space Station. Because you measure the distance, you know the energy that the, that the star emits. If you have some mathematical model for stars, then you know the mass. <coughs> for example, just one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go back to this and. In fact, uh, radial velocity was used to detect the first planet around the, what we call a main second star, so a sun-like star, let's say. It was done by uh, Michel Mayer and Didier Kellos in a famous paper of 1995. They were using the Elodie spectrograph at the uh, Observatoire uh, de Provence in France. And they found what Joey called uh, before a hot Jupiter. So they found a planet of, in orbit of four days, uh, which was uh, at least more um, more massive than half of Jupiter. So when Meyer and Kellos found that, they were a bit puzzling because <laughs> they didn't expect to find this kind of thing. But finally, they refined their data and say, OK, that's probably true. And it's, it was the case. And uh, so this planet is called 51 Pegasi b because uh, it's in the constellation of Pegasus here. Right, so next technique now, it's called transit. Um, so the idea of transit is to follow the brightness of the star of a, of star versus the time. And if by any luck you have a planet orbiting this, uh, this star, uh, when the planet will cross the disk of light uh, of the star, um, the planet will block some light and create some shadow. And in fact, uh, the shadow, you can measure it. This is what we call uh, the transit depth. And again, because this signal is periodic, when the planet is outside the disk, you see a constant brightness. Then it starts to get dimmer. And when the planet exits the disk, uh, you see the transit, um, the brightness increasing again until to reach this plateau. So transit, you are able to measure the period again because you follow uh, the light from the star for a long time. And each time you see a dip that gives you roughly the planet, uh, the planet orbit. And the, the depths of the transit is uh, proportional to the square of the radius of the planet. So you measure the radius of the planet and the transit depth. Oh. Uh, and the period, sorry. So by far, transit is the most prolific method we have so far. And the reason is, um, <coughs> is easy to understand is because we use photometry uh, to monitor the brightness of star. And this is uh, much, much cheaper to do cheaper in comparison to spectro, uh, spectroscopy. So for example, typical exposure time for photometry is like five minutes when spectroscopy, you probably have to go for one hour at least. Something like that. And uh, we detect 80% of planets thanks to uh, transit, and especially <coughs> thanks to Kepler, which discover roughly 2,500 planets. So in few <coughs> words, Kepler was a revolutionized mission from NASA. Um, that observed this field of view in the Cygnus constellation for five years and monitor the brightness of millions of stars for five years. And from this, scientists were able to extract more than 2,000 planets. So that was very cool. 
the next one is called gravitational microlensing, which is the one we use, I use here in DLCO. And it was, uh, it's a consequence of the prediction of Einstein uh, theory of relativity. So in few words, uh, Einstein world is, our world, Einstein says that our world is uh, 4D space time. And actually, uh, the mass in this space time curve, uh, curve it. Okay. So in this cartoon here, suppose you want to observe this red source here, a very background distance source. Here it's a galaxy. Here are our telescopes. And what happened is if there is another object in the line of sight, here it's uh, the white lens is, is another galaxy, the mass of this galaxy is going to curve the space time around it. And the this curvature uh, will create uh, a change in the path of the photons coming from this source. And in fact, this lens is going to create several images of the distant source. And naively, you will say, because this, li this lens here blocks the light from this, you shouldn't see it. But in fact, you see it here as several images in red. So in, in the middle, you see the light from, from the lens here. And in red, you, you see several images of the distant source, right? So <coughs> microlensing is exactly the same concept, except that the source and the lens are both star, OK? So the idea is you observe a distant source, and you have another star here which cross the line of sight between you and your telescope, create several images of the source, and then it leaves the lab of sight. And in addition to create several images, what happened in gravitational lensing, which is um, very close to optical lensing actually, is the source coming, the flux coming from the distant source is magnified during uh, the passage of the lens, right? So again, as transit, if you follow the brightness of the source star versus time, you will see this kind of Gaussian shape curve. And this is also for very fundamental uh, difference with uh, transit. I will explain a bit later. But now I imagine if the lens is a star and there is a planet. So this is, this is actually the same as the video. But here, imagine your lens have a planet. When you cross the line of sight, you see the main magnification due to the star. But in fact, the planet itself, if you're lucky enough, can act as a very little lens and create this kind of little blip that we call planetary anomaly. And when the lens leaves, then the brightness decreases. Uh, and so if you, if you very observe densely this curve and you catch this, you are able to extract the parameter of the uh, planetary system of the lens. And in fact, you are able to measure the mass ratio between the planet mass and the lens uh, star mass. But contrary to other techniques, this is not periodic. So if you miss this, you will never observe it again. Okay. So Einstein predicts this in 1936, but he said, of course, there is no hope to observe that. Uh, he was right at the time being because the technology was very different. And, uh, and we know now that the highest um, abnormal field, the probability of alignment between two stars is less than one on a million per year. So for any, any given star, the probability to have such alignment that this phenomenon occurs uh, is less than one in a million. So that means we have to cover like billions of stars to be able to catch some of these things. But we succeed, and uh, we have no, no more than 50 planets, um, thanks to this technique. And finally, the last technique I'm going to describe today is uh, direct imaging, which uh, can seem to be the more obvious, just take a big telescope and observe <laughs> star and try to catch some light from the planets. Uh, that's right, but you need very big telescope first, which are very expensive. And also the problem is um, to do that, you, you have to know that the light ratio between the light coming from planets like you know, Jupiter and the sun, the ratio is at least a million. So that means the star is a million times brighter than the light coming from the planet. So basically that means if you observe just a star like this without any preparation, you will completely see nothing. You will see full of brightness mm -hmm. and the star will co totally contaminate everything. So you need to somehow 
uh, hide the light from the star. And this is what is shown here in this little video. You see here the light is hidden from the star. And you see there's four dots moving with the time. There's actually four planets that are back in this system, HR8799. And these are done by Marwa in 2008, but there is also uh, more study on that. And this technique is by far the one we, you can extract the most information about your exoplanet because you have light coming from it. So you can have the period, the distance, sometimes some part of composition, etc. So that's very remarkable. Uh, the problem is it's uh, very, very, very hard to do. What, what, what kind of telescopes are currently capable ten, of this? Uh, eight meter, ten meter. But Earth-based? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And the hard part is blocking out the light. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you need you need a big telescope to have a lot of photons to catch uh, photons from there. But you need a very good techniques to hide this kind of light from the star. I'm just curious, is it done optically in the telescope or is it done after the fact? Uh, there is at least three filters. Uh, often there is one hardware. Uh, also there is combination of uh, um, Interferometry, uh, interferometry? No, not interferometry really, but you know, wave construction. Oh, uh, adaptive optics is. No, you mean the, the you combine shading? Something on, on the software side. Yeah, on the software yeah, side. Uh, yeah, on the software side. You know, you take a phase on light and. It cancels each other. It cancels, yes. Yeah. yeah. But sorry, I don't know how to present that. Weren't they supposed to do this from space? Uh, Sometime soon. So there is a NASA mission that might do that, but I will speak about it later. Okay. Um, so direct imaging is very, um, you, you have a lot of data from it. So that's very remarkable. All right, so here is a chart showing the number of planets detected uh, versus the year. So you can see that 20 years ago, we didn't know any. Hmm. And now we know more than 3,000. And the rate of discovery is, uh, I don't know if it's exponential, but it's a lot. So every time people talk to me and say, did you see about this planet? It's like 100 a day or something. <laughs> so I can't keep track anymore. Uh, and you see here uh, that radial velocity and transit are by far the techniques the most prolific. And here, this big jump, these two big jump actually uh, correspond to two data reliefs of Kepler. And, and I'm sorry, the um, uh, direct observation is not even. Uh, not yeah, yeah. To it's, called, it's called imaging. Oh, okay. Uh, in, uh, it's some a, kind a of. Bit. It's the pink. Yeah, pinkish. Gotcha, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, there is not that um, much. Double click the. This? The top button. And then, oh, oh, that's fancy. Here's the flippy Fancy. Single click and hold. Uh, and just break it. Okay. Well, we believe you. It's a little bit. Trying to show off. It's a little bit. I, I think they're imaging that maybe 20 planets right now. Okay. It sure is striking, though, to be able to actually see yeah, exoplanets. Yeah. Like, that's, boy. Yeah. So, so, you so can also see the ones where the orbit doesn't cross between us and the star. It's going yeah. around it. Yeah. There's so. great many more. Yeah. That's all. And. For the following, I will uh, finish by showing you also why all of these techniques are interesting. In fact, it's because they are very complementary. Uh, and to uh, highlight this, I will show two plots. Uh, so the first one is the mass of planets versus the distance uh, to their whole star. And you see that this plot is uh, divided by the snow line. So snow line is similar to uh, habitable, zone, habitable zone line that Joel described, except that this is uh, a little bit further in the sense that this is a line, the distance from the star where the ice begin, uh, the water begin to be ice. And this is very important because we, we think from our planet form formation theory that uh, this uh, place is very important to form planets, especially mm -hmm. giants planets. Mm -hmm. And you can see that this line uh, cut uh, the fault technique in two groups. So here in red is transit and yellow radial velocity. So these two techniques are very sensitive to planets which are close to the host star. And uh, this is uh, intrinsic to, their, to the, mag, the mass behind it, it, meaning that they are more sensitive to close planets. Right? 
And microensing in comparison and direct imaging, they are uh, intrinsically, again, more sensitive to planets which are far from their host star. And so by using all of this technical together, the nice thing is you can cover the full parameter space of this diagram and understand in a very good manner uh, what's going on. And the second plot is again the mass, but it's not distance from the uh, from their host star, but distance from the Earth. So distance for where we observe them. And you see again that all of these techniques are very complementary, like uh, radial velocities observe planets which are very close to the Earth, transit a little bit more closer, and microensing very far away. <coughs> so to give you a scale, um, 10 parsec is like neighbor, and here it's uh, the center of our galaxy. And here it's a schematic uh, representation of this last plot. You have a map of the Milky Way. Uh, here, we are here in the spiral arms. <coughs> and the distance to the galactic center here <coughs> is roughly 8 kiloparsec. So it's 24,000 light years. And I don't know what is that in light. I'm sorry. Uh, and you see that the majority of planets we know are quite close to the sun in uh, astronomical units, let's say. And you see this red cone here, it's actually the field of view of Kepler. Mm -hmm. And for example, you see that microensing, we are sensitive to all of this, um, to, to planets all along this uh, line of sight. So again, all of these techniques are very complementary. And I will finish with three future missions uh, that's going to help us to understand more about this planet. So the first one is TESS. It's actually not future, but present. It was launched uh, last, last year. Um, and it, its primary mission is to make two years of transit survey of a bright star and to find at least more than a thousand planets. I think we are 300 right now after a year. Um, the European Space Mission Plateau is going to be launched in um, 2025. It's going to do transit also, and we plan it's expected to find more than 10,000 planets. And finally, uh, the last one is W first, uh, which will be launched in 2025. If everything goes on plan, and it's going to do microensing, and we expect to find more than 1,000 planets. And potentially, W first will have a coronagraph, um, as you as you say before to do uh, this kind of direct imaging uh, planets, but it's dependent on funding and so, and that's all for me. <laughs>